Right. Well, so so with that, let, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, you co-founded your first company, Micromuse, as you pointed out, in 1993. Served as its uh, co-founder and CTO until 97. Yep. You uh, then stepped out and founded Riversoft uh -huh. uh, after leaving Micromuse and built such a great technology that it was acquired by Micromuse, uh, your former company, uh, uh, you know, in 2002. Uh, I will point out that Riversoft uh, IPO'd while you were, while you were still there. Um, uh, and then... I also want to note that in 2005, uh, IBM's Tivoli department, IBM Tivoli, acquired Micromuse. Um, so that was a, probably a very nice exit for you as well uh, after the fact. And then, of course, you founded uh, uh, Engini. Is that how I pronounce it? Engini. Yes. Engini. Okay. Um, and in 2003, and your technology was acquired by Riverbed, not to be confused with Riversoft, in 2007. Yeah, and if that wasn't enough, uh, you founded Promethean Labs, uh, an incubator, in 2008 uh, to 2011 with your current co-founder, Mike Sylvie, yeah. who was also your co-founder at Micromuse and Riversoft. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, Mike and I go back a little way. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so there's a lot in there, Phil, um, that I kind of want to tear down. One of the reasons I was so interested, you know, I interview founders and CEOs all the time, but I don't interview a lot of founders and CEOs who had multiple successes over and over and over again. And that I think is something special because that doesn't always happen, as you and I both know. Just yeah. because you have one successful startup. I mean, it may give you a greater probability to be successful the next time around, but there is certainly are no guarantees. Yeah. And you have now done it several times. So how do you <laughs> – tell me about, you know, when you look at it from, from the first company, Micromuse, to now, I have to imagine you've learned from some of your mistakes. Let's talk yeah. about some of the mistakes you made in the past and how yeah. you adjusted each time. Yeah, and, you know, do, do, what the impetus was behind starting the next company. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you know, do, do, you, do you have all day? Um, yeah, well, you know, right. as I, went, I think I said some, to somebody yesterday that, you, you know, youth is the place where you start to accumulate the mistakes that add up to wisdom. Um, That's correct, and, yeah. You know, and it kind of is really how it went. I mean, you know, when I, when I, when I started Micromuse, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea oh, that right. I was really starting 30 years a company. Ago. Yeah. yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I had all kinds of naivety around, um, you know, what it took to raise money, what it took to hire a, a, you know, a team, you know, what the core of a software organization really needed mm -hmm. to be, um, you know, uh, how to keep the relationship between engineering products and your customer base in the right mm -hmm. place. I was really going on instincts as much as anything else. And I, I've always been a strong believer that, um, it, you know, in, in the product industry, software industry, you know, the truth will out. If you, you know, not to riff off of the title of your, of your podcast, you know, if you authentically solve a difficult mm -hmm. problem, yeah. um, so you don't cut corners, you don't, um, you don't busk it, you don't make it up, um, you know, you're in a far better position um, to build a, a great company again, as a, another, um, in fact, when we were selling Riversoft to Micromies, um, you know, the, the then CEO of Micromies, Gregory Brown, uh, and, and, and apologized for the colorful language said, you know, you can't make chicken soup out of chicken shit. And he's quite right. <laughs> um, you know, you have to have, you know, table stakes is a great product. So that's mm -hmm. always been a focus for me and I'm a technical guy. So, yeah. you know, it kind of comes, you know, it's crashed to me. It's, it sort mm -hmm. of comes naturally to care about mm -hmm. um you know the technology um being correct mm -hmm. but most of the mistakes that, that that i have learned are around you know all of the stuff that you do to convince yourself to not listen to your instincts and 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 mm -hmm. and also to convince yourself that you're right um before you're right uh you know richard feynman once said the easiest person to um, fall is yourself and you know it's been a, a long battle um, around making sure that you you know you really do the footwork um, to understand a given business problem don't just mm -hmm. assume 
uh, that what you did last week will work this week. And uh, don't just, you know, jump to conclusions, verify, verify, verify. And, you know, most of business is people. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you've got that sort of an easy feeling in your gut about an individual you're working with or trying to hire, listen to it because it's probably right. Um, and you can get blinded by your own, you know, desire to either not address, um, you know, when somebody's not working out or, or, or being too much of a rush to hire an individual that you shouldn't be hiring. You know, there's all of those, um, I would say is kind of about the maturity, um, to, you know, to know, uh, when your instincts are in the right place and when they're not. Mm -hmm. So in, in all your prior companies up to now, you were the founder or co-founder and CTO. And I believe this is your first gig as the chief executive officer. Not quite. Um, not quite. No, I mean the, the, you know, Riversoft, I was CTO at Microbees, uh, Riversoft, um, I, uh, I took the range just as we were going public. Um, okay. I was, it was a, it was a British structured company and I was executive chairman, which is like being CEO. Okay. Um, and, and the guy who was CEO is really like being the COO, mapping it to, um, mm -hmm. uh, US structures and also in Gini, um, I was CEO, I meant Gini. Right. Okay. Um, so so it, it goes a bit, little bit longer than that. And um, okay. it is an unusual setup. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, I have this kind of post-apocalyptic view as to determine what somebody does uh, for a living, which is like, okay, if it all stopped, uh, you know, if you took away all the fancy titles and the, right. this, that, and the other, what would you do to make a living? And fundamentally, I'm a technical guy. So fundamentally, CTO is... Is perhaps the yeah. perhaps the instinctual role that I could play yeah. in any business. Um, CEO is what I do at, at Moogsoft. Um, and you know, you you take those skills and you bolster them. I've got excellent business managers around me, a fantastic head of revenue, a fantastic mm -hmm. um, you know, head of engineering, um right. fantastic right. head of marketing. You know, I've got some really, really, really good solid folks mm -hmm. that kind of fill in the fill in the gaps. Um, okay. and a great make, head you look, of make you look good, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe look good. And that's the, that's all that counts, right? Right. I think Jay. So, you know, as as a chief executive, what would you what do you what do you believe is the biggest distinction from having been a CTO for you? I mean, granted, uh, CTO is not the chief executive, but yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to understand the business. Um Yeah. It, you know, it's important that any any function inside of a company if you can't do it you are beholden to somebody else's point of view as to what should be done so right. i think it's important that you round yourself off um so mm -hmm. although um you know my background is technical i spend a lot of time with sales i understand intimately um how our sales mm -hmm. process works yeah um you know i spend a lot of time in the field Mm -hmm. um, both on the sales and the post sales side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to be a pre sales person before I got into all this. So sure. I kind of have some appreciation for it. As regard to finance, you have to become literate uh, with finance. I'm, I'm never going to be the person, um, you know, uh, add, adding up the accounts because um, I don't have a CPA background. Yeah. But I can build a very convincing business model um, in Excel spreadsheets that will allow me to experiment and you know, riff with um, my finance folks and management mm -hmm. team about, you know, the what ifs, right? What if we bring out a new product? What if we go into mm -hmm. a new geography? How does that mm -hmm. look? So I, I think the important thing is, is you have to have a breadth of understanding of the various different piece parts of the organization and, uh, you know, be willing to understand perhaps the really key thing. You manage engineers in a completely different way to how you manage salespeople. Of course. In a completely different way to how you manage finance people right. And, right. and so on and so on and so forth. And you have to be able to shape shift your management personality into That's the right. context that is relevant to that point in time. So Amen. if I manage salespeople like I manage engineers, I'm going to get a lousy outcome. In the yes. same way that if I manage yes. engineers like salespeople, I get a lousy outcome there. So you, you sort of have to learn that kind of chameleon mm -hmm. uh side to your personality you have yeah. to bring that out as a yeah. way of um of, of being able to be effective cross-functionally yeah i'm so glad you pointed that out phil because i literally just had that conversation with a founder ceo earlier today 
um, when we talked about communication, uh-huh. right? And 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 how we don't. So many people do not often realize how their language that the, how the language that they use lands in the world of the receiver. Yeah. And yeah. it's, yeah. it's critical. I mean, it, it's for most of us, I think for so many of us, it lives in a blind spot, you know, until, yeah. until we can start looking at, let's talk about the language you're using. Like if somebody talked to you that way and use that language, how do you think that might land for you? Yeah. yeah. Right. And so it's so great to hear you say that, that you recognize that already. It, yeah. And it's, you know, th- there's an empathy thing there. Um, right. but you know, perhaps even more than all above all of that, um, you know, when, when people ask me what's really special about Moogsoft and, you know, there's lots of things I can say there, by the sure. way, you know, I could bang on about the technology. I could bang on about, um, you know, the people, all the rest of that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. but really it's the culture that, yeah. that sets Moogsoft apart yeah. and, you know, right at the heart of that, uh, I, you know, I, I mean, like, I guess a lot of people in my position, you know, you've got this kind of sort of pat, here are our five principles type thing. Yeah. But really, I could boil it down to, to a very simple one, which mm-hmm. is about what you think a business is. And a, a lot of CEOs will say, worst the effect of it is a money making machine. You know, I, I'm here to return investment, return on yeah. investment for my shell. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, I'm trying to make a billion it. dollar bit, yeah. or I'm trying to make money for my, you know, it's like, it so misses the point. Um, you know, it's a societal structure to mm-hmm. business. It is about creating an outcome for the people who work in it. That's right. It is a commune for mutual betterment. And mm-hmm. I see my role, uh, job one, two, and three, as making my colleagues successful mm-hmm. um, in the expectation that that's how they approach of their daily life as well. And yes. if you if you look at it like that, all of the other stuff that people obsess about mm-hmm. just happens, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, build that great community. They will show up for your customer base. They will put extra effort into making product. You build a home for misfits. So your competition will not understand how you won. Um, you'll get better products. And yeah, your investors will make money. Your employees will make money. You'll mm-hmm. be a big company. Um, you know, it, all of that just follows. But if you chase the dollar, if that's your attitude, that's right. then I'm sorry, but you're just probably a dick. <laughs> you are my kind of guy, Phil. <laughs> Carol Schultz here. Thanks for watching this excerpt from Authentically Successful. The conversation doesn't end there. So if you want to hear this episode in full and all my conversations with many other successful founders and CEOs, please visit verticalelevation.com slash podcast.